Mr. Gripper here, down coming at you from the man cave at home. Uh, we're going to start with our online education for zoology class. The phylum mollusca, um, one of my favorites, but we have a couple different main classes that we're going to study here in phylum mollusca. So the main uh, organisms that we're going to see are going to be in a group called the bivalves. Those are these guys here. Uh, they're the clams and oysters, mussels, uh, those kind of mollusks. And then we have something that we're probably most familiar with around here, and those would be what we call the gastropods. Those are the snails and slugs. And so these are these guys here. And then probably my favorite uh, group in the mollusks, the cephalopods, that's going to include the cuttlefish here, the squid, and really one of the most amazing creatures uh, would be the octopus. And we'll talk more about the octopus when we, uh, when we get to them. So let's go ahead and get started to discuss their general features. So they are classified in phylum mollusca. That's going to be our phylum we're talking about today. They are commonly referred to as mollusks, and they get their name from the Latin word molluscus, which means soft. So in the world of body plans, everything we've talked about so far has all been uh, an invertebrate, and these invertebrates are going to have two different kinds of body plans. Um, this is, these creatures have what's known excuse me, as a hydrostatic skeleton or also known as a hydroskeleton for short. And that basically means that their bodies uh, are going to be supported by water pressure. And if we go back a slide, um, especially these guys. So you look at this creature, the slug here. Now, of course, the snail body is going to be supported by water. The shell, of course, is going to not be supported by water, but it definitely, the, the soft part of the body is supported by water. And the octopus, the whole body, everything is supported by water. And we'll find out that the octopus is really, really unique in its ability to get in and out of places because their body is so, so soft. Um, the squid also, it has an internal structure uh, that helps keep it rigid, but most of its body is supported by water and the cuttlefish is the same thing So that's the kind of body plan we're looking at here. So let's go ahead and skip back to this slide They have what is referred to again as the either a hydrostatic or also known as a hydroskeleton so that in turn then is in reference to their soft bodies and some of them will have a lot of them will have a shell now you'll find out that some of them in case of the snail has the one shell and if you look at the clams and oysters they have two halves to a shell which is why uh, their class is called bivalve they are the bivalvia they have two halves or two valves uh, so those shells help and support and protect their bodies now there are lots of different kinds of animals that are found in phylum mollusca and just to name a few, of course, we have the snails, we have the slugs, clams, squids, and of course, the octopi, which is plural for octopus. So let's go ahead and continue on. We'll talk about some of the general characteristics of phylum mollusca. The body is bilaterally symmetrical. So opposite to the phylum that we have talked about before uh this one we had one of our first were the echinoderms if you remember they are radially symmetrical meaning that their body plan radiates from a central axis the sea star was pentamerous meaning it had five planes that it could be divided into to make equal right and left halves a bilaterally symmetrical organism there's only one plane that you can use to divide that animal into right and left halves similar to us there's only one plane that would be right down the between our eyes divide us into equal right and left halves so 
the mollusks are no different. They also have bilateral symmetry. They are unsegmented, so we go back to our last unit, the segmented worms, the annelids, that those organisms had a clear uh, segmentation to their body. Mollusks do not, and they many times will have a well-defined head, meaning uh, a front end or a collection of their sensory organs can be found there. So the ventral body wall, again, ventral meaning their belly, will be specialized with a muscular foot. And depending on the group we're talking about, that foot is going to be uh, used differently. Uh, the foot primarily is going to be modified and used for locomotion, being able to move within their environment. The dorsal body wall forms the mantle. We'll talk more about the mantle later. And the mantle cavity um, will be in, enclosed inside of that. It is modified into either gills or lungs and will secrete the shell. So if this organism has a shell, it will be secreted by the mantle is basically what that is referring to. So let's go ahead and move on. Uh, phylum mollusca, continuing on with some general characteristics. They have a complex digestive system with a rasping organ called the radula. Now, the snails and slugs have a very prominent radula, and that is how they eat. So basically, imagine uh, if your tongue was a cheese grater, uh, that would be very reminiscent to the molluscan radula, uh, and that's how they eat. They use that organ to lick whatever they are, it is they're eating, and it just grates the food particles off and into their mouth. We'll talk more about the radula uh, in the next few lessons. They have an open circulatory system, which, of course, uh, hopefully we remember that an open circulatory system is one in which the blood will not remain in the vascular tissue through its entire lap through the body. It will leave the blood vessels at some point and then be uh, recollected uh, somewhere and then brought back to the heart, uh, pumped through a blood vessel, and then it will uh, be released and shower the organs, providing nutrients and oxygen and so on and so forth. Uh, the one exception, of course, would be the in the cephalopods, which are, again, the squids and octopi, they will have a closed circulatory system. And most of them are going to have a three-chambered heart. Uh, different from us, ours is a four-chambered heart, but the mollusks have a heart with only three chambers. Okay, The respiratory gas exchange is either by gills in the aquatic organisms, lungs for some of the terrestrial mollusks or on the mantle or body surface. So some of them are actually able to dissolve oxygen just from the surface of their body. And again, this is going to be depending on the species in question. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. They will have either one or two, an organ called the metanephridia, which acts as their kidney. And again, that is going to be to filter out the nitrogenous waste out of their bodies. The nervous system will contain paired cerebral ganglia with a ring nerve uh, or a nerve ring in gastropods and cephalopods. So that means the uh, bivalves are going to have this paired ganglia, so a very small collection of cells that kind of act as a brain and then we go to gastropods and cephalopods, and they're going to have a ring of neurons that are going to act as their brain. They have sensory organ of touch, smell, taste, equilibrium. So um, we don't need to expound upon this too much. We all know what the sense of touch is, the sense of smell, uh, our sense of taste. Equilibrium gives them balance, lets them know which way up and down is and keeps them upright in their environment. And then there is the ability to see in some mollusks. Uh, many of them have just very simple uh, eyesight where they're similar to our last group, the annelids. 
that doesn't really give them much more than letting them know whether they're in the light or in the dark, except for the cephalopods. The squid and octopi have very, very highly developed eyesight. And we'll talk more about their eyesight and how they use it, um, not only in hunting, but also in communication within uh, their own species. And um, also, obviously, for defense against predators. So they have very, very good eyesight. Uh, economic importance. Uh, here's a little uh, something that uh, you may or may not be aware. Uh, we do use mollusks a lot in our uh, economy, primarily as food. So if you've ever been to the seafood restaurant and ordered oysters on the half shell, you probably know what that looks like right there. And also, uh, oysters are used to make pearls. And, of course, pearls are used in jewelry. So the way, they'll talk about this for a minute, the way they make uh, pearls is different than what they used to do was just as they collected oysters for food uh, if it had if that oyster had a pearl in it then they would just collect that pearl and it was kind of a shot in the dark you know i don't know how many how many hundreds of oysters it would take to find a pearl uh, but that's how they used to do it and, and they found out that the oyster does this uh, creates this pearl when a, a a particle, an irritant, gets inside of the mantle. And what the oyster does is that irritant, based on its name, obviously, irritates the body. And so what the oyster does is it lays the material, the same stuff that goes into the inside of the shell, lays that material on top of that irritant. And over time, it will cover it again and again and again, making this very smooth and soft pearl inside. So whatever it was, it could be a grain of sand, it could be a, a pebble or whatever that got inside of there, irritated the oyster, and so it, it secreted the substance and basically put it inside a shell, and that shell uh, is nice and round and smooth and doesn't irritate the oyster as much, and that's where pearls come from. So today what they do uh, is they take oyster shells and they grind them up into little pieces and then they take those pieces and they put them inside of other oysters, forcing them to then grow pearls and they will have a, a huge oyster bed where they will then take those oysters on, on huge trays and set them down in, in the water. Though They give those oysters some time and they will develop uh, a pearl around that piece of shell, and that's that's where pearls come from. So today they are farmed, whereas in years past it has just been uh, again kind of a luck of the draw to find uh, to find a pearl inside an oyster. So let's continue on with our next slide on economic importance. Uh, some mollusks are destructive, and they are bad for our economy either by destroying Shipworms got their name because they would eat, they would get inside and they would eat the wood of ships, but they also will damage wharfs or piers. You can see here uh, where these boards have been um, slowly over time, the shipworm has been eating that wood and deteriorating that wood and has weakened the structural integrity of that pier. Snails and slugs often damage gardens and other vegetation. So here we see this large leaf and all these holes were caused by uh, slugs or snails. And we know that these are caused by slugs or snails because the holes are out in the middle of the leaf. So a caterpillar will start on the edge and just eat its way through the leaf. So this, so it'll start here on the edge and just keep going back and forth and will eat a whole section of leaf. But since the framework of the leaf, the outline of the leaf is still intact here, and you can see the leaf is still there, but just pieces in between the venation, the veins of the leaves, and they have just ground with their mouth part. Remember I talked about that radula, that cheese grater of a mouth part. They just ground away the part of that leaf and created that hole. So that's where that comes from. So we're going to go ahead and stop right there for today. So, uh, thanks for watching. That's lesson number one for phylum mollusks. Stay on your Schoology and 
Uh, watch for tomorrow to see what uh, tomorrow's lesson will be. Thanks, and talk to you later.